So I just pressed in some pieces of cardboard into this one to give it some funky shapes and just use that extra, uh, extra stuff. Now I'm going to hold this up and we're going to talk about glaze right now because what I like about this one is it shows your work. Like if you're going to go through all the trouble of giving some texture to your piece, then don't cover it up with a thick glaze that hides all of your all of your hard work. You want to have a little bit of translucency to it so that you can see your texture. Um, problem is with the more groggy clays like Raku and your um, armstone is that the colors can sometimes look a little muted on them. So they're not quite as uh, uh, vibrant or pretty as you might be expecting. So you're going to have to play with your samples. That's where you do those test tiles. And I know everybody just wants to go for it and get their work through the kiln. But those test tiles really do help you out. So that, that way you're not going to be disappointed. For example, like this one I thought came across as just a little muddy. It wasn't one of my more favorite favorite colors. I'm not, I feel like I'm a little blown out with the color, with the light here, but, um, but playing with stuff, I did find, I layered some and I got really pretty, pretty colors. And this is on an arm stone. So you can get some really pretty colors. So this one had, um, let's see, it was a, an aerobi. You, I, I think I'm saying that aerobi. Uh, I don't know. I just felt, seen it spelled out, but um, different, different ways of saying it. Yeah, there's Aribe. different. Aribe, that's I've heard it more like that. That's right, the Aribe, and it also had um, um, like another. Oh, it's kind of popular right now. It has like a little bit of that glitter in it. Um, uh, it's oh, I don't have it right next to me, but it added just a little bit of shine and, and texture to it, but still lets you see what's happening underneath. So, and then it's so easy. So, you know, you get these cheesy little things for your party and then it's just so tacky to put out the plastic, right? I mean, come on, you're a potter. You make these beautiful things. What are you doing taking plastic to a party? That's ridiculous. So what I, I really think you just got to go with the nature of it, you know, like, like I've heard about um, one of our one of our famous artists that Mondrian he he was supposed to have thrown pieces of paper down just randomly and he let them fall down onto his page and then that would let him decide where he was going to make his squares and lay out some of his pictures. Uh, now when I went to go verify that I never did see that anywhere. I did a lot of research this last this last year so I never saw it anywhere but I love that story and I've actually taken that approach. So even if Madrian hasn't done it I have, so, and I like the story, but you can do that with your little fruits and stuff, you know? So just lay them out. I know it seems really silly, but some people just overdo it, right? So, and then just kind of shake them out, and then you got a pretty presentation, and then just let it, let it be natural. So um, we are going to move on to how I just throw these out. It's super quick and fun. I'm gonna have to move my, Sweet treats. Boom, boom, boom. And I think right here I have some armstone. All right. I hope that's not too abrasive of a sound. So I'm just taking my big chunks. And I like working from, like having some uh, canvas to throw down to so it doesn't necessarily stick. And then I just let it go. And I'm just kind of working with how things want to be. Also, 
awesome way to get out your aggressions. You know, kids not doing their homework. Bye, y'all. I'm doing some clay. I'm going to slam out some clay. Feels great. So, now, one thing that you get taught is for your clay to have an even thickness so you don't get unnecessary cracking and certainly something you're really worried about when you're working on a wheel and trying to make everything even because it's shrinking and, and trying to stay cohesive. However, I don't mind in my work, so like and especially in something like this, just a little bit of cracking. If it comes in from the sides, that's just a little added element nature. But also I do find that when you're slamming it out like this, that gradual, difference is so small between where it's thick and where it's thinner, you can play with it. And, you, and it looks just a little bit more organic when you're not so stressed out about, about those things, you know, about thickness. Like if you're, you're like, oh, it has to be completely even, then, you, you know, you're going to be very unhappy because this is not the way to get perfectly perfectly even. So, and now I'm just going to kind of tear. And you kind of see how that's looking right there. I will come in and consider the texture of the clay because now I've been throwing it out on canvas. It has that canvas texture on there. So I might come in with Money, there's a question on what thickness are you trying to achieve? Ah, well, you know, when my dad's squirting in the ketchup into our spaghetti sauce, he says, you yeah, do it until it feels good. So <laughs> I'm going to say till it feels good. But uh, I, I wind up anywhere between one eighth inch and a quarter inch. So, um, on the smaller things, I, you know, I kind of like them thin, so uh, they're lightweight and they stack kind of nice. So, um, another question is, do you weigh the clay depending on how big you want the plate? Uh, I suppose, um, there's, no, I don't. <laughs> that's a <laughs> that's a great way to do it if you're wanting to get some consistency from one place to another. So if I were making the same one again and again and again so that they're really matchy matchy, then that's how I would approach it. Um, but more or less what I would I would do is take a handful, you know, like I'm like, oh, okay, this is about the same size. So I'm weighing it just with my hands and my mind slam it out and then I would have this one for reference and then I would go back to you know to the next one and um, if or so far I've been doing these kind of as one-offs as kind of accentuated people use them in their tea sets so they have like these beautiful tea bowls that they've got and then these sit out with the little plates and and things I've seen them pop up in the tea ceremonies and things like that uh, so uh, but if you're wanting the consistency, then I would really say, you know, that's a great idea. Go for it. Um, make a template and, you know, lay it out, but don't, don't overstress about it or you're going to, you're just going to overwork the piece and be sad because it's just looks over, overworked. So then I'd probably just come in and have my sponge to sponge off some of that, some of that canvas texture if I didn't like how it was looking. Um, work it on a different texture. But I kind of, I, I do kind of like a little bit of that texture from the canvas to show up because it, just not too much. So, and then, Uh, the other thing is I like it to curl at different places. So that's going to sometimes support itself depending on, are y'all able to see my, 
my hands here. There we go, maybe that's a little better. So, um, so if it's small enough, it'll support itself a little bit like that. But even then, you know, I might get in there with a little extra clay and just kind of be like, okay, why don't you encourage that and let it, let it dry that way. And then uh, think about all those art things. Um, unity, is, am I creating like kind of a, a shape that um, when your eye dances around it, is it coming back to itself? Or is it being led off out into, to look at something else somewhere else? So that, that's one thing I consider too when I'm doing a shape like this. So I would do that. Another question is uh -huh. uh, what percentage of shrinkage for the clay that you're using and what clay are you using? Okay, so this I'm pretty sure is armstone and uh, let's see, I think I would have to look up um, porcelain shrinks quite a bit more. So if you're used to working in porcelain, then um, I think that's like upwards of 18%. And then uh, this, I think, is closer to 12. Uh, they wind up, um, you know, because it's got that grog and everything um, to it, that's not shrinking quite as much as some of the other, your other clays. So, uh, oh yeah, I had another idea. Um, let's see. Okay. So, I went out. My aunt likes his little flowers that she saw on my property, so. Y'all have all done this, pressing things into it. But it looks really nice with these these broken edges. So um, that's something to consider. Is like if you're doing like a cheese board thing, just allowing that to be nice and long with the little flowers pressed in. just for a little added information. So she liked the purple ones. And then that can be done really simply when you're coming to the glaze. Like this is a tiny little purple flower, but I don't really have to mimic that later on. I could just do it all white and it would still look, you know, kind of graceful and are you able to see? How's my camera and my light? It's all right. Yeah, we can see it okay. As, well, at okay. least it down at the bottom with the stem. Yeah. So, and then I like using some found objects. So my little extra bowl around the house and I would line it because you don't want to really get it stuck. But that'll get it lifted off of the table a little bit and give a pretty, some pretty edges. So I will post these to my website at some point, bonniebrushwood.com or sunshineclay.com. So give me a while to, uh, to fire my work and then you guys can see how these turned out later on. Uh, did you have any other questions? Do you want me to show anything else off, Sarah? I'm not sure how we're doing on time. We are mm -hmm. perfect on time. Uh, does anybody Great. have any other questions for Bonnie? That was very cool, very organic. Yeah, you just kind of go with the flow and it feels so good. So when, right. uh, you know, when you, when you find yourself at the wheel, um, just feeling too rigid and stuff, sometimes it's nice to step away and just take a break and let, and just, you know, if everything you're doing is falling apart, just throw some clay around, do something fun like this, and then you'll find you have a fresh take and, and really, a. um, a, uh, you're probably going to be a lot more successful after you've just slung some clay around for the fun of it. <laughs> Absolutely. 
All yeah. right, you've got some people thanking you in the in the chat for sure. Oh, great. Thank you, guys. Thanks for coming to my studio. Y'all have a wonderful day. Enjoy Clay Week. Yeah, thanks, Bonnie. <laughs> all right. Um, yeah, so if you all are familiar with Bonnie or have never met her, she is one of our um, visual artists in residence. Um, so we do have a residency program at the DAC uh, that you can apply for. It's in ceramics or um, uh, darkroom photography. And it's basically a work exchange program where um, in exchange for um, doing some volunteer hours with us in the studio or covering some open studio time for students, that sort of thing, um, you get access to the studio. It's a little different at the moment since we're not actually open, but um, we're working on getting back to some semblance of normal, but we'll do that call for uh, residents again uh, this spring. So if you're interested in that, I'll put the link to that web page in the chat. Um, all right, Jennifer, are you ready? All right, so Jennifer is one of our ceramics instructors and um, she graciously offered to do a demonstration today on smoke firing. Um, in order to do this one, I have to do a don't try this at home um, <laughs> uh, warning out there because it's not full on like how exactly to do it or you really probably need to look into it a little bit more. But um, yeah, I am super excited to see it. So take it away, Jennifer. All right. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so yes, do not try this at home even if I look like I'm at home, okay? <laughs> Um, it's really something that you should have practiced with a professional potter first, even though it's a very simple process. Um, still, you're dealing with fire, so you always want to be very careful. So, in any case, we got that out of the way. Now, let's see what it's all about. So, I have some pieces here that are smoke fired on my table, which you're probably noticing, and I have some that have yet to be. So, I'm going to tell you a little bit about not only um, the firing itself, but how I prepare for it. And to get things started, um, way back when you first make your piece, and it's greenware, unfired clay, um, like this little piece, you have an option to do something interesting to make the pit, or sorry, I say pit firing, but I mean smoke firing. <laughs> By the way, I'll go ahead and divert. Um, pit firing is a far more sophisticated version of smoke firing. I'm showing you the most primitive process available <laughs> in this world probably the first way that anything was ever fired. Because it's basically, imagine a primitive culture sitting around the campfire. How do you drink water? Well, you cup your hands, and then you realize you have clay nearby, and you're like, well, actually, I could just form a little shape and scoop up the water and drink more. So it's a lot more convenient. And then if that shape dried in the sun and got a little harder, it might hold water a little better, or just might not taste as much like mud, and you can drink out of that. So imagine that same cup just rolls into the campfire one day and it gets a lot harder and it holds the water better. It doesn't seep out as easily. So you can imagine how, you know, kiln firing began as simply as this. So I'm going way back to the most primitive possible way to do it. <laughs> back to the actual piece. So I have some greenware here and I could just leave it as is and I could fire it or I could do something to it to make it a little more interesting after it's finished. I'll show you some variations on finished pieces. So if you see this piece, this little pinch pot has been smoke fired, but, oh, let me put on a little more light so you can see it better. And if I put it close to the camera, you're gonna notice that there is no real reflection. It's just kind of dull and matte. But then if I show you this one, and put it close to the camera, Notice on the, it's light on this side, it's dark on this side, and notice that reflection from the lights. So that reflection is because this has been coated with what's called terra sigillata. And terra sigillata is a super fine slip that potters typically make themselves. If you, um, ceramic suppliers don't really carry the actual product of terra sigillata, they carry the items to make it. Um, what happens when you make it is you usually are mixing some type of clay with water and another uh, substance called a deflo de I can't think this well, <laughs> deflocculant. And when you make your terra sigillata, in case you're curious how it's spelled, I don't know if my camera is showing it to you backward. It's T-E-R-R-A, 
S I G I L L A T A. Terra sigillata, beautiful Italian word meaning sealed earth. And when you make it, you have to let it sit. It has to settle out the heart. You know, it has some hard sludge at the bottom of the container, and you'll siphon out the good stuff. And you can really see the difference in it over here because there are layers. I'll get a little closer. You can see the liquid sloshing around, and then you can see a light color. And then on the bottom, you can see a darker color that's kind of an orangey color. And that is because I used Teresa Gelato with some stain so, um, to make it a little bit of a color. So basically, everything settles really badly. No one would want to sell you a product that settles like that, and you have to stir and stir and stir to get it all useful again. But once it's ready to use, I brushed it onto this piece, and I used something that's pretty soft and furry, you know, like a soft brush. And these are really inexpensive brushes. They're synthetic. You can buy them anywhere. And after I brush on the liquid, I'll have a thin, watery layer. I'll probably do another layer to be sure. But I'll let each layer dry a little bit in between applications. And then you go in and you burnish. So burnishing is basically rubbing it or polishing it. You can do it with your bare hands. You can do it with a metal spoon and rub into the clay. And you'll see a sheen start to develop. So it's not glossy, shiny, because it's not glazed, but it is giving you some reflection. So it's really nice. You can even use just a piece of plastic to rub it in. And you may be thinking, well, I know nothing about terrace gelata. I can't purchase it. What do I do? So what you can do is if you have a pretty smooth pot, you can get in there and rub it in any way. A real favorite tool besides the ones I just showed is a smooth river rock. You know, sometimes people want a really polished stone and you can get in there just by having that hard polished material. It needs to be unscarred so it can't have dents and divots in it. And then you can rub it really, really well and get a nice sheen to it. And it also kind of compacts the clay because you know how, oh, you want to do all this when it's relatively dry. So um, that's a dangerous time to be handling reading where it's super fragile. But you'll notice that as you're packing it in from that burnishing, it'll seem almost stronger. You know, it really packs in and tightens the pores and actually makes it slightly less porous than it would have been, but it's still pretty porous. So, after your dreamware is prepared, and it does, again, you don't have to do a thing. I did nothing to this little guy, except for throw it into the smoke fire after it was bisked. So you do have to do your bisque fire, E-I-S-Q-U-E, if you can't read that. Um, so that's written on there. And the bisque, I know you probably can barely tell the difference. I can feel the difference more than see it. So this one still has that soft kind of um, powdery finish from being just raw clay. But this one is already hardened a little. So it has gone through the first firing. So it's very important that it goes through this firing first so that all the water is driven out of it. Because if you put this straight into a smoke fire, which is basically a little campfire or bonfire or something much smaller, then it'll just pop and explode. You know, you'll have pieces everywhere. And it's very dangerous to your eyes. So don't do it. By the way, you're not doing it anyway. <laughs> all right. So those are some pieces that I was preparing. These are some little um, stone light shapes. They're still clay. They're actually a porcelain clay body. And they also have terrace gelata. It's going to be hard to see. I'm going to show you up closer a couple of shapes. This one you saw in my container that it had a little orange on the bottom. So it's kind of a light orange and is really hard to see on here. But it's a kind of, I call it citrus flesh because it's just like the fleshy part of a citrus, piece of citrus, and it's just got a little bit of an orange tint. And then this one has a little bit of a baby blue. You can probably almost compare it to the wall behind me. But I do like to make little test tiles. So here's one that I made in a class I taught once, and this one's kind of a rosy color. Again, because the light's a little bright, you may not be able to see the actual color. And it also depends on your computer monitor. <laughs> But in any case, what I did on these to make sure that I could both see the color and how the smokiness looked around the color is I just put a little strip of foil on and around it so that it would be, it would have some sort of a resist pattern. And, you know, I probably just folded it casually and wrapped it around before I fired it to make sure that there was an area where I could see the original clay. 
and then I could see the smoky effect as well. So that's a good way to do a test. Some of them I just kind of covered up so much that you can barely tell that they've been through the smoke fire. But it's kind of interesting. These are very faint colors, but there's a little bit of rose, a little bit of green on these two. And I always even test the original, which is just my base tone. So I know it sounds like, oh, she's talking about Teresa Gelada, but not smoke fire. <laughs> Getting there. Again, you don't have to do a thing to your piece. You can have, this one has nothing on it, and it just has a nice smoky outcome. It's just a little less shiny than the one that has Teresa Gelada. Okay. And then here are some of those stones that actually went through a firing. And you're going to get a variety of results. You won't just see like everything looking like, you know, one another. They're going to have all sorts of possible outcomes as far as how much color you get, um, even how much sheen. Sometimes if they get a little too hot, they don't have as much shine to them. But some of these, you know, hardly got any color at all, like the bluish one in front. So, and then when you have more surface, you may have a little more variety. This is still a very small piece, but at least it gives you an idea that you can really vary the surface. The bat side, sometimes the side that's sitting down gets the least amount of smoky goodness because it's a little hard to get the flame under there. You actually have to have the flame and smoke touching wherever it's going to have this result. So one side might be a little less. And if you can do things like prop up pieces to where they're leaning against each other, channeling the air, getting a little better airflow, then you have more potential. Or you can just purposely put it sideways like they did with this one. And that's why one side is a lot lighter and the other side is a lot darker. So there are lots of ways to not completely control the firing, but to give yourself some different outcomes that can be very interesting. And also, you don't have to have cherry switch water to get that sheet. You can, you can totally fix that up at the end. You can, this one had nothing on it, no terrace or slot or anything. And you can see in the light that it actually has some reflection. You can see the light reflecting off of it. So it's got a nice little shine to it and it looks polished and shiny, and shiny in person. What I did here is I got one that had, you know, no finish to it, like this one. And then you can use like a pasty wax or a floor wax. It's a liquid floor wax, an old rag that you don't mind destroying, basically. You can use bowling ball wax, shoe polish that's clear, whatever waxy product you have. And you can rub it into the surface after the smoke firing and get a nice sheet to it as well. So there are so many possibilities for such a primitive, limited process. Amazing. So how to actually prepare for the firing. I'm going to prepare the firing right here and then we're going to walk outside and I'm going to show you how I did a little smoke firing, very small one. One way to do it, what I have done a lot, especially with bigger pots, is I'll have a metal can that's like a um, something you get at a feed store, like a country feed store, and it needs to be metal, obviously no plastic at all. Um, and by the way, you don't want anything plastic related to the fire because that's toxic if it burns. Not that you're doing the firing, by the way, but if you see someone else doing it, you can tell them, <laughs> no plastic, okay? And then you're going to use, if you use something like foil, that's a good idea because it's metal. Um, and you can use a metal bucket like I, I often do. But I'm going to take mine out to my smoker and put it in there. So what I would do to get prepared, I have a lot of things that I could do in advance. Of course, I could just get my pieces and put them in here. and get some combustible material. These are just napkins, you know, some rolled up napkins, you can use newspaper, you can use dried leaves, you can use yard trimmings, but you have to be careful not to have anything too thick that will take a long time to burn. You're not trying to make a campfire that lasts for any length of time. You're trying to make a small, little less than one hour firing. So um, what you want to do is make sure you have ways to channel air between your pieces so that the flame will also travel. So if you can bunch things up, maybe tight and loose, it'll help to start the flame and maybe carry it over. And then you can put your pieces around that. That's one thing to consider. But there's some other things you can do that are really interesting to prepare your piece. I have some string soaking in water and that string can become a resist. 
And actually, I'll show you that in just a second because I also want to show you another resist, which is masking tape, just regular old masking tape. I usually take it off the roll and maybe stick it on a surface a few times to kind of loosen up the glue. Otherwise, they tend to stick a little too well. And then you can use this as a resist. Maybe just tape a stripe right around the middle of your pot. You could, you know, cut it into designs, little zigzags or something like that, or just maybe cover up a little portion of it, whatever you like to do. And I can show you a little bit of how it turns out. Let's see. This one's probably hard to see. It's very tricky, but I'll go into the inside and you'll see a little bit of a light area right across the middle. That was actually a stripe of masking tape right in there. On the outside, you can kind of tell, it's probably hard for you to see without being up close, but you can see that white patch and then immediately go smoky. There was some tape crisscrossing on the bottom as well. So it can be a way to help encourage lights and darks, if nothing else. It may not be super graphic as far as the uh, linear outcome, but it can definitely give you some possibilities. The foil was another thing I mentioned that can give you possibilities. You can wrap foil around it and get some resist that way. You can also, as I was about to say, use some wet string. And it doesn't have to be string. It can be something else like really long grass that is not dried out yet. If it's still green, like I use lemongrass sometimes because the strips are very, very long. And you can tie them around a piece. So this one, I'm just going to kind of start and give it a little wrap. Maybe do a little spider web design by wrapping it around a few times. And you can see how that looks there. And on the front as well. Since this is a little dish shape, it's not as tight to the front as it is to the back. So I'll probably get a better pattern on the back. <laughs> but that's just the way things go sometimes. Sometimes your pots are even more interesting when they're upside down. All right, so I can tie that together. And that can be in my pile as well. I kind of like, it, it's kind of a, it's a bit of a catch, but I love to have things elevate. Like right now, this is kind of sitting on top. And so I have a good little air channel to get down to the little stones. And I can put some, you know, maybe put a little paper under here and see how that works. And again, you can use a variety of thicknesses of paper. Instead of just paper towel or newspaper, you could use um, something like, um, cardboard, but maybe not a thick cardboard, really thin cardboard like from a shoe box or paperboard like you get from a cereal box. One catch is that you have to be careful about glossing surfaces. Sometimes they contain plastic and they can stain your pieces in an ugly way as well as being bad to burn. So that's something to kind of double check on, you know, see if it looks like it has that slick glossy surface to it. Like avoid the, um, the advertisements in your newspaper those glossy cards and just go for the plain newsprint. All right, so let's just put a little bit of combustible material in here. And we're gonna walk this outside. Now, of course, the actual firing takes a while, so I've got one that I fired a little while ago, and hopefully it looks good. We'll find out together, won't we? Okay, so I got this guy. I'm gonna grab my camera. Pardon the shaking while I detach it and move it around and change the view. And let's just walk you outside. Luckily, I have an assistant to help me along. Thanks. So hopefully I can keep an eye on what we're doing. And he's gonna light it on fire ever so carefully. And you know, anytime you want to light a fire on purpose, it's always a lot harder than by accident. So you have to really check it over. But I'm going to slip this one out before things get hot. Because this one I did earlier. Excellent. So what I'll do is I'll let that flame up for a little while and get a really, you know, get all those combustible materials to have a chance to fire up. 
And then when they start to calm down, we're just gonna put the lid on and leave the holes open and let it smolder. All right, I think you get the idea. Let's head back in. It's kind of hot out there anyway. And give me a moment to get this. Well, let's just look at it as it looks so live action this way. Ooh. So now you can see there's all this ash. And you do need to be careful, not that you're doing this, but your potter needs to be careful to open it up, make sure it's not too hot, make sure there's no, there are no sparks and there's nothing still going on in there. Let's get our water handy and check it out. Here's another little dish that I wrapped up in string. Got a little bit of smoky goodness. Let's unwrap that string. Some of it breaks because it burned. By being wet, it didn't burn all the way through. And I got a little bit of that spider pat pattern, that web pattern. Pretty cool. And then on the other side, still has some string attached. That side was the underside, didn't get too smoky. Great thing about smoke firing is I can refire it as many times as I want until I get the results I like. If I get too much, like if my piece comes out and I'm like, oh, it's just too much darkness. I really wanted some light um, spots here and there. I could just put it right back into the bisque kiln, refire it, all the smoke will be gone because this smoke firing is so low temperature that you will just abolish everything when you bisque fire it. So after you're done, give it a good wash and get rid of all that ash. And the water will help you decide if you want to add wax. Because when you see it wet, it'll have a shinier appearance and that'll give you a better impression of what it would look like if it was waxed. All right, I'm gonna get back up here, change everything so that you can ask me questions if you have any. Just a sec. That was really pretty cool. <laughs> oh, thanks, Sarah. Um, so, oh, how long do you let it sit on the the smoke just as, until like the combustibles inside stop smoking? Or, Oops, sorry, let me see if I can switch around. <laughs> I was trying to get back with you guys. Yeah, you can. Um, you basically want to make sure that you are done. Um, flaming and you want everything just burned down obviously you know just like with any fire um, I could douse it with water if I had to and just get everything you know to stop but I usually try to put a small enough amount of combustibles that I don't have to I won't have a raging fire because if it gets too hot I won't even get a smoke the effect so overdoing it's no good but I'm sorry what did I answer your question Yes, you did. <laughs> it, I, it just depends, the amount of time depends on, on how much combustibles you put in there, essentially, yeah. Yeah, yeah usually you just want enough to kind of fill the space around the pieces because anything extraneous isn't really smoking the piece itself. Sure, sure. So typically when I have like a larger bucket, like say it's the size of a big mop bucket, um, I'll, and I have some, you know, maybe I have a few pieces in there like this. I'll go ahead and put plenty of combustibles all over, all different thicknesses and thinnesses, and um, light it all up. And I'll let it flame for quite a bit with the lid open, and then lit it with holes, um, or a prop to lid if I don't have holes in the lid, and after it's really flamed out. So I need all the material to burn first, and then I can just let it sit and smolder. And it can kind of finish off that way. It'll get all nice and smoky, but it's terrible to breathe. <laughs> you know, nobody wants to be around it. You know, it smells good at first because it's campfire light, but you know, it's smoke. Somebody's asking, can you use charcoal? I, I didn't quite hear you. I cut out. Oh, sorry. Uh, somebody's asking if you can use charcoal. Every time you say the word, can you use what, it goes out. Charcoal. Oh, charcoal. 
Um, if anything, there was charcoal beneath, but I wasn't using it. Um, you want combustible material near your piece. And so since charcoal just kind of sits in, and it'll heat your piece, but you have to have the material creating carbon so that it'll actually add that smoky coloring to your piece. So you would actually want some materials that are flaming. Will the, will the finished piece hold water or moisture? I'm so glad someone asked that because I meant to tell you. So for a limited time, it will hold water, but not forever. Um, it is still basically this square. So it's still very, very porous. And that means that if you fill it full of water and put a plant in there and, or use it as a base on your table, it'll eventually start to seep out and ruin your table. So make sure it's not on good furniture, make sure it's out on the porch or in the yard or something like that. If you want to use it as a planter, you can do it outside. And you know, think of it as something that is healthfully disposable if you do that. You know, otherwise just keep it as the sculpture. <laughs> right, right. All right, <laughs> awesome. Does anybody else have any questions? All right. So and just as a quick safety note, even though no one's gonna do this. If I had long hair, I would have it tied back. I have gloves for picking things up, and I wear cotton clothing that's non-synthetic when I'm near a fire. Just a little FYI. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great. <laughs> um, oh, one more question. Um, says, when I see people do this online, they do it overnight. Is that a different thing? I, I'm sorry, you see people do it online? They're doing it overnight? So you're probably seeing a pit fire, which is like 10 times more sophisticated than what I just did. So <laughs> that's, that's like going way up in time historically. Um, a pit fire would be like your earliest kiln. And you often, and a pit can be above ground, kind of like a fire pit can be above ground but it's basically a much more thorough firing. They're putting more materials that can actually give you more coloration. And so there's a little more variety in tone and it's a longer, hotter firing. It's still a very low fire, but it's, it's way hotter than what I'm doing. And it's, um, and usually because there are lots of pieces, lots of space, lots of combustibles, you, you do have to flame it up for quite a while and let it smolder for possibly overnight. Great, thank you so much, Jennifer. All right, our next right. demo is, is Katie Lynn, and she is another one of our residents at the Doherty, um, and she is gonna do some throwing techniques and talk about tools as well. Well, thank you, Jennifer, that was awesome. And Bonnie and Ryan, who's not here, but those were so fun to watch. Um, so like Sarah said, I'm Katie, um, Katie Lynn. I'm one of the artist residents along with Bonnie at Doherty Art Center. So usually I get to see a lot more of your lovely faces there. I recognize some of the students that are on. So thanks for joining. Um, I'm just gonna do some wheel throwing. This is my newest baby that I got um, since we have had limited access to Doherty. I was able um, to spit the bullet and got myself a wheel. You can see it's in um, my office with my boyfriend's um, workstation right behind me. So he's very patient with me um, working there. But it's been um, fun. So just going to kind of throw a few things, show some of the tools that I like to use both while throwing and then I'm going to um, show a couple that I like to use um, in carving because I'll do a lot of detailed carving work after I throw. So um, let me know if you have any questions along the way. Um, I'm happy to answer anything. All right. So um, first I'm going to just use one of these bats. I don't know what type of bat this is speedball bat. Um, I like these square ones just because when I'm making a lot of cups at the same time, um, it, uh, I can stack them next to each other on a table while they dry before I take them off of the bat. Um, all right. Next. Oh. Can you see me? 
Sorry, I did it wrong. <laughs> no worries, that's okay. That's better. It lets me get all my wiggles out at the beginning anyway. <laughs> Let me, maybe I can do it then. There we go. Okay, that makes more sense. Okay, so I, um, first one I'm using, I'm throwing with a, um, a mid-fire clay today. Um, it's a Laguna clay called Speckled Buff, which I really like because it um, has a little cute specks in it after you fire it. Um, but this is fired usually cone five or cone six. Um, it's a little groggy, I think. I'm not sure of the technical terms, but it's got a little like sandy feel to it. Um, this is about a pound worth, I think. This is usually what I use to make most of my cups, so I'm a little bit more. Um, but yeah, so we'll, we'll start here. Um, doing some dry centering there, which is a, I learned from Ryan actually from shadowing or just watching some of his classes and how to read. Um, we'll just get going. One of the probably best tips that I ever learned was from one of my first instructors back in Tucson, um, Jaron um, Strobach, and he, I, he always saw me like wrestling clay on the wheel when I was trying to center it and gave me one of the best tips, which was to use my, um, put my uh, elbow into my hip, kind of using that as a leverage to give myself, so I don't necessarily have to have like the strength to do that. So that has been like a game changer. Now I, I use it a lot, um, especially when throwing larger pieces of clay. But, um, so my elbow is the first tool of today that we'll talk about, <laughs> or my hip, I guess. So something I've been using a lot lately, um, just as I've been working on trying to get more uniform with my, um, my shapes and make things look alike when I make a few of them, and um, that is this uh, caliper. So this thing is pretty neat because it, um, it has multiple options. So you can use it when you're making um, lidded pieces, say you want to measure the um, inside of a vessel, um, from here to here, and then you want to measure the lid that you're going to make for it like this. So that's really helpful when you're maybe making a piece, a pot, and then a lid that you're going to put on top of it. Um, what I've been using it more recently is for um, shrinkage rate. So there's two different holes here, you might be able to tell. Um, one of where you can put the screw in, and if you have it through the first hole, then that just means these are a one-to-one -one ratio, so it'll be the same when you're making those lids. Um, but if you put it in that second hole, it skews um, the rate a little bit. So this uh, measurement at the end would be what the finished product would look like after it's fired. And this larger side would be what it's like um, while you're throwing it. So I think it's a 12 and a half percent. Yeah, 12 and a half percent for shrinkage, which is about average, not all the same for clays, but um, this is really handy when maybe you make this perfect piece and you fire it and like, man, I didn't take measurements of that. Like, what is it? I'm never going to be able to replicate it. But this is really nice because you can um, measure it that way and then take it right onto the wheel to use that measurement. So, um, okay. Make sure I actually can center a piece of clay here. I keep getting distracted. Okay. So we're just going to pull this up into a cylinder. And this is just a regular sponge. I got like one of those big giant sponges, but I cut it into squares um, so I can use it. I use these um, actually to just to have little sponges all around the studio because I find myself wanting them everywhere. <laughs> okay. Compressing the bottom here to make sure it's nice and strong after it's fired. So, 
let's get this nice and centered there. I think there's an air bubble. Just using a sponge to get out any extra water, out, excess water in the bottom so it's not sitting in there. And a little bit more so I can bring this up. I got a little carried away there. Okay. Oh, well, we can use one of the tools I wasn't planning to use, but I don't think we're good there. I'm just gonna take an air, air bubble out. Okay. So, First things first, usually just to kind of make a straight cylinder, I used to like to use just a regular um, wooden rib. Um, I like this right angle because it kind of helps me to know where the angle's at. I think this one's a little rubbed down, so it's not quite the right angle anymore. Um, but I'll just bring this to the edge and then come and pull, push with my inside finger to the out against the rib. And then we'll bring this up into just a straight line. I'll slowly bring my hand up. you can see there that takes off a lot of slip um, and excess water. So that um, not only brings up my, my cylinder so it's nice and straight, but it also just removes a lot of excess um, wet clay that will be, um, that strengthens, strengthens the piece as well. So it kind of compresses it um, and removes the excess water. So we got two more time. Next, I've got um, another wooden rib. I think these are both actually from like the Kemper school, like the toolkit that you get. Um, if you take a, a pottery class at Dory, they usually recommend that you have this, um, but they're just the basic tools there. Um, so this one I'm just gonna use to cut in the edge of my piece a little bit. So I have a corner. After I have that there, I'm gonna use this to cut underneath with my needle tool stop the wheel, make a cut, and then I can take off that extra clay from the bottom. Okay. Um, next one, I've got kind of a finishing sponge. Actually, Leslie Libby, who I think I saw on there, is um, one who gave these to me, recommended um, them. But this one is a nice one to just kind of smooth out that bottom and I can use it to smooth out that corner that I just made. All right. And, Let's see here. I thought it would be fun um, just to do this with y'all because I don't know, why not? Um, I just got some new texture tools from Garrity Tools. You may have heard of them. Um, and I haven't even used them yet. You can see they're like brand new um, out of the box. Um, so let's see. I know this one looks pretty fun and exciting. So this is the texture tool for, I'm not um, a sponsor of them. So just not, it's not a plug or anything. Um, yeah, so this one is kind of similar to the rib that I just used, but they have a little bit of texture so we can see um, what that turns out as. I haven't used it before, so maybe we'll start with one of the ones that's a little less crazy. So we'll bring this up to the edge again. And then I'm going to bring my finger up just like I did before and press that in. Well, there we go. I think it used to go in a little bit more because it should be a little bit rounded. So I need to bring in a little bit more pressure with my hand from the inside more than I would really think to usually. Until I can see that all the way form. That's pretty neat. Okay, so you can see that took off a little bit of clay on the rib there. Okay, so let's wipe this guy off. One last thing that I would usually do, um, actually let's do that one more time just to get a little bit smoother. All right, not bad for the first attempt, I'd say. Okay, um, and then I like to use a little chamois. Um, I think it's, um, I'm not sure if it's exactly the ShamWow brand, but um, it's just a little piece of 
um, chamois texture and it's nice and smooth. I wet it a little bit and then I use that just to compress the rim of my piece and that makes it just so it has a nice mouthfeel when you're drinking out of it. Um, so it also compresses the rim, make it stronger and makes it feel nice and smooth. All right, so wire tool. I'm just gonna cut this guy off so it'll be ready to take off at a later date. And there we are. Not the cleanest of these cuts, but for the first time I'd say that's pretty good. So I'll put this over here. All right. So I'm gonna throw um, a little, <laughs> super cool. This is a fun one. I know, I'll have to try another one. So let's do a little bit larger. I think this is a one and a quarter pound. Um, which I'll use for some of my larger mugs. Maybe we can see, oops, sorry, that's shaking the whole thing. Um, if anybody has a preference of what size they'd like to see, feel free to say in the comments. Um, and we can, we can try one out and see how it turns out. So, put those there. Seal this down. All right, I think we'll do a bowl for this next one, just so we can um, try out another tool that I have. Maybe we can even experiment with one of these new tools. I should have done a larger bath for this, but it'll be okay. One more cone. Let's go for it. I'm gonna leave the foot a little bit thicker on this. Just for bowls, I like to have a, a thicker foot to trim. And for this tool that I'm gonna to use, it'll come in handy. Okay, do a little bit of compression on the floor. And first, throw it up into a cylinder before we start the bowl shape. Leaving it a little bit on the thicker side so when it goes and expands out, it'll get thinner because it's getting further away from the center, so it's stretching that clay. So you wanna start with a very, fairly thick cylinder. Okay, we'll wipe away this extra clay. Use that finishing sponge and just get a little bit of the extra um, water and clay away from it. Okay. Now I'm going to push um, kind of down and up with this bottom, um, my right hand that's on the outside. Um, while with this inside hand, I'm going to kind of create like a, a flat, almost um, bowl type shape. So that's going to be going on the middle towards the outside. So I'm trying to kind of round out that corner that's on the inside bottom create the bowl um, rounded edge. Okay. Just a little teensy bit of water. I don't want to put too much water in while I'm doing a bowl because it can get out of hand really fast. And we'll just slowly start to bring this out. I'm 
press the top. A little of that water out. Let's maybe do one more pull. All right. I like to release right before I get to the rim, especially when I'm doing a bowl, just so I can keep that rim a little bit thicker, um, just so it's a little stronger. Um, make sure I get all that excess water away. And now one of my, um, another favorite tool of mine is um, this rib. It's a mud tools rib and it's the red. So it's our like most flexible. It's, it's really, um, really, really flexible. But I really like this because it can go around any type of curvature of vase or whatever it may be or bowl. Um, you do have to keep it pretty tight in your hands when you're using it because it is so flexible. It can really easily like cut into your piece. Um, but I'll use this um, just to kind of go off the around the edge and clean off a little bit of that excess clay like I did on the one before. So that takes off a little extra there. And most importantly, from the inside, I can use this to kind of compress that bottom and also reconfirm that curvature that I want to see on the inside. So I'll support it from the outside while I do that. Okay. So now that I have that situated, um, here's another tool that I'll use. Um, usually, I guess with my bowls, sometimes my mugs. Um, this one's by Dirty Girls. I believe it's called their foot fetish. Um, but this one, you can see the bottom right here um, will help create a little foot so you don't really have to carve or trim a foot onto your piece. I'm all about um, shortcuts. So um, this one's really nice because you, you, it really cuts down on your trimming time because it cuts out um, the foot that you'll see. Um, the other side can also be used um, to shape the bottom of your bowl too, depending on what the size of it is. It probably won't really work with this one, but we'll use the bottom part. So keep this really strong in my hand. Um, that's what that hole in the middle there is to, to hold on. Keep the wheel going pretty, pretty fast. And I'll bring this bad boy in. All right. So that took off a little bit of clay there. And now we have a nice little foot on the bottom. So usually after I do that, sometimes it kind of messes up just a little bit here. So I'll come with a sponge or that other, um, that red rib and just smooth it out a little bit with my fingers and the sponge. And then I might just do like one more pull to get that smooth. Um, another option too, I know a lot of folks like to see like the throwing lines in their pieces, um, which I like that as well. The kind of spirals are really pretty. Um, but I always like to make sure that I take away any extra slip first. So I smooth it off um, with the rib like I did before. And then um, at the end, I'll kind of maybe slow down the wheel a little bit and do a little bit more of a dramatic pull up. That throws it off a little bit off center, but then you can see that it will have a little bit of those throwing lines. It would have pushed on the rim a little bit before too. Let's cut this guy off. Let's see. There's a couple of comments of mesmerizing and love it. Oh, <laughs> awesome. So you can see there, it kind of has the spiral that goes around it. It looks pretty cool on the inside too. So it just gives a little bit of a texture, but it still keeps it nice and strong um, since we took away that extra clay beforehand. All right. Let's see, got a few more minutes left. So I was gonna show, just since we, we kind of worked through most of the throwing tools that I, I use the majority of the time, I think. But I have um, a few other tools that I like to use um, after I'm throwing a piece. So I'll probably throw just a pretty basic form and then um, just spend lots of time carving and, and playing that way. So I wanted to show a couple of those and clean off my hands a little. And if you have any questions, about anything I use, let me know. Okay. Okie dokie. 
So I'll come over here so I can see y'all a little bit better. Okay, so for this guy, I have a few different tools that I use for it. Um, you can see the detail. Um, there's a line at the top. Um, I actually carved that in while uh, I was trimming it. So I first trimmed it from the bottom up, but then um, while the steel on the wheel head, um, I carved out this, these two lines. Um, just with this guy that would be used kind of as a trim tool, um, usual. So that has just a rounded edge there. Um, that same tool I used to carve the triangle. So both um, this guy and that guy, as well as the diamonds in the middle here. Um, I used just this trim tool for that. Uh, one of my favorite inventions or like realizations was um, this hole puncher actually. So I don't know what size this, this is exactly, but um, it's a nice kind of semicircle, so it um, cuts off pretty well. Oop, there's still a old piece of clay in there. Um, but that one I used to do the kind of flower design on here. Um, for that, I just did kind of some carving like such um, and out. So that keeps it pretty consistent as far as the depth of it rather than carving because um, carving can definitely be a little bit, might go deep or shallow, so this one controls that a lot better with the hole punch. Um, I also used some hole punches. I think I used a pretty big one, or I might have used the smaller one for this, um, for the base. So I carved out some feet on this guy, um, and for that, I used this hole punch to carve these out. Yeah, I think it was this size that's shrunk a little bit. Um, but that helps to keep with the consistency of the size too. Um, I did it while it was fairly wet, so I had to trim it while it was pretty wet. Um, but it, it makes it a lot easier if it's, I mean, a leather hard, um, a little bit um, more wet than leather hard, if that makes sense. Okay, um, so that's all that I used for that guy. Um, this guy right here, it's kind of hard to see, but there's a very subtle um, texture um, on the outside of the base. It's almost water-like a little bit. Um, and that one I just used a regular old putty knife for. So um, just this guy right here, you can get them at Home Depot. And that um, I just to kind of do some slicing away to create those edges. Same um, idea with this guy as well. You can see that this one's with um, a turquoise glaze, but this is a raw clay. Um, this is the Cinco Rojo clay that they sell at Armadillo and make there. Um, so that's just the raw clay after the carving with this um, putty knife. So that one definitely is very, um, very finicky to the clay being the right texture. It can be a real pain in the butt if um, the clay is too dry. So that one definitely has to be trimmed um, while it's pretty wet as well. So you have time to do the carving. All right, and then my last tool is actually just a regular trim tool, same with that Kemper um, toolkit that comes when um, you might be doing the faucet doherty, um, just a regular old trim tool. And I use that um, to do the mountains on my moon mugs. So you can see a little bit of texture there um, at the base of the mountains. And that one, I just use um, this edge to carve away that way. So I kind of do a little bit between this rounded edge um, here a little bit. So those are my kind of go-to tools for carving and throwing at the time being. Um, but um, All right, there is a, <laughs> what's your most recommended tool to get for beginners or any essential tools that you can't live without? Yeah, for sure. And it's funny because I used to be like a just like a no tool kind of girl, but it's it's just so fun to play with stuff. So really for me, I mean, um, a needle tool um, that comes in really handy because that you can use to um, test the thickness of the bottom of your piece. So when you are throwing and you want to make sure that you have um, the bottom of your piece is thick enough, but not too thick because that can make a really heavy piece. Um, I'll use the needle tool to press down into the bottom of my pot. Um, press my finger up to the point where it's going to be and then I can bring that out and I can see okay so there's there's about a half inch there or a quarter inch um, that can also help you, you can write your name on the bottom pieces um, you can cut rims off of the bottom of your or the tops of your pots 
um, a sponge, just a good old sponge. Like it doesn't really matter what kind. I, I like just a regular sponge. Um, you definitely need that to be adding water to your piece um, to take away water from the piece. Um, and then probably just a, a regular um, wood rib like this, especially um, throwing at least for how I learned to throw. We really started off with just cylinders because the more that you can learn that basic straight up and down cylinder, which this will help with, um, then you can go and shape pieces from there and make them a little bit more exciting. So yeah, I would say this guy, um, I would say, yeah, pretty much that. You could maybe go for um, another rib like this, but I would want it to be a little bit, um, have a little bit more rigidity to it because this guy I think can definitely get out of hand pretty fast. So <laughs> they have different, I think the orange one might be the, the one that's a little bit tougher, but yeah, those would be my go-to. Really, don't, you don't need more than that. Good question. I agree with the, with the red rib and I will, I'll be using one here shortly too. So <laughs> in yeah. a completely different way. Um, yeah, no, that's so versatile. I use it pretty much for everything, so. <laughs> All right, are there any other questions for Katie? Well, thank you so much for tuning in and we miss all of you students who are here. We wish you could be with you in the studio. So it was fun to have a little bit of that though time. Um, if you want to check out any of my work, um, I have a website. It's katieannclay.com. Um, and I also have um, an Instagram that's also just katieannclay. So feel free to say hi. If you have any other questions on there, you can definitely, there's a, um, a contact form on my website. And there's also, you can message me on on Instagram too. So always happy to help. So now, thank you, Katie. Uh, and like she said, she, she gave you all that. I did put a link in the chat about our residency program if anyone is interested. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, Ryan uh, built a studio, you know, during, during this pandemic. Um, and I kind of did the same thing, which I'm standing in now. Um, I'll give you guys a, a quick tour. Uh, I started this in March right after we all got told to shelter in place. I've been thinking about it for a while anyway, um, and then it just seemed like the perfect, uh, I thought it was something good to occupy my time. Uh, moved to Austin about 10 years ago, and then we bought this house about five. And so um, my studio has been in our unair conditioned garage, is that better? <laughs> um, and so I've been struggling through that the last five years and I thought I would give myself a treat and um, be a little more comfortable while I work and it's also turned out to be a nice home office as well so I'm gonna walk outside and um, show you guys it from the outside and also my kiln shed that I have out there I do live right next to a busy road, so I apologize if it's super loud and you can't hear me very well. I'll try to um, try to speak a little louder, but let me turn it around here. Okay, so it's my backyard we're going out into. I've got my little stock tank pool. Um, in our backyard or fig tree that's kind of almost done with the season. Uh, but here is a view of my studio as I worked on it this summer. Um, and I, I did build it myself. Uh, had somebody else do the electrical, but we, we took care of building it ourselves to save some money. And I just like doing that kind of stuff. So um, off to the side here, I have my kiln shed and I have um, a little test kiln, a little Scott 609. Uh, which actually runs off of a regular outlet um, and so it's it's a good kiln if you're looking for something um, to use at home without really having to install any new electrical and it is is a decent size I can get a couple levels of uh, little mugs in there um, and then I have a big kiln as well and you're probably wondering where I got the kiln cover <laughs> um, and it's actually not a kiln cover. It is a cover for a big green egg grill. Um, and so when I built this out here, I was a little worried and it and worry came to fruition that when it rains, it does blow in sometimes directly on the kiln. So I went ahead and solved that problem. 
um, obviously take it off when I fire, but yeah, there it is. Um, go back inside here. All right. So I have, these are my shelves that I store all of my finished work. Um, and they are actually also the shelves. They completely break down um, flat and go in the car. And they're the ones I take to uh, festivals when I do those. Uh, I acquired a hand-me-down slab roller, which I am thrilled about because um, I just have been hand rolling slabs. And I do a lot of, uh, wheel thrown work, but then a lot of altering afterwards where I add a lot of slabs. Um, they have another set of shelves just for, um, you know, works in progress. Um, my table is actually um, a 36 inch hollow core door uh, that I put some trim on the edges and then it sits on top of um, some cubby shelves. So it's kind of a multi-purpose, uh, bench and I've got everything stored underneath all my glazes and underglaze and some tools probably wondering where my wheel is and down here I have my wheel on wheels um, so I made a little uh, cart for it and so it, it I can put it away and wheel it back in and actually both this table and the cart for the wheel came about because I lived in an apartment and our my studio was in our dining room so had to kind of be able to put everything away and clean it up so um, I'm going to get this back up here so I'm gonna go over um, some of the printing I do and surface decoration I do. Um, so a lot of my work that's finished up there has these screen printed designs. Um, and so this is an underglazed tissue transfer. So I'm going to talk about that first and then I'm going to talk about what I've kind of been working on um, lately, which is, is changing gears a little bit. It's still a, a form of indirect printing and, and underglaze transfer, but uh, we'll get to that in a minute. So, uh, like I said, the image is I screen print and I screen print onto tissue paper. So this is literally like Hallmark tissue paper. Um, just got it at the, the grocery store. Um, I've cut it down. It usually is pretty wrinkled from being all folded up in there. That doesn't bother me because I am not looking for perfection when I transfer pieces or transfer the images. Um, they're going to be a little modeled anyway. Um, but you can uh, you can actually iron this very carefully on a low temp, um, and it'll take away the um, the wrinkles. Uh, other people I've also heard of other people using like uh, sewing pattern. Uh, material, which is basically yeah, the same thing, just tissue paper. Either way, what it is, it's just really light, flexible paper. Um, so I have a screen here, which is one that I made. Um, I studied printmaking in college along with ceramics, so that's how I kind of ended up where I'm at. Um, if you want more information about making screens, uh, feel free to, to message me and we can, can talk about that. You can also, I believe, get them made at Jerry's here in town. Um, and there, there's other companies as well. So I just have um, some black underglaze here that I'm gonna use. Um, and I'm just using it straight out of the container. Let me find a different brush. Okay. And what I'm going to do, I'm just going to pour a line of underglaze here at the top of the screen. And this particular batch of underglaze is a little, little thick, which is fine. It actually prints a little bit better if it's thick. You can take underglaze and either leave it open and let it dry out a little bit so it's thicker. Um, or you can add cornstarch to it. Uh, you can mix in mediums, print mediums. 
Um, there's all different techniques out there, and there's there's a few different good books on um, on a lot of uh, ways to to alter the underglaze. Okay, so I don't know if you can can see very well, but I kind of just spread that out after I poured it in there, so it was even. And then uh, there are fancy, uh, you know, screen printing squeegees. I just have one that's, you know, for doing a shower or a car window, I don't know. Um, and so I'm gonna, gonna pull the underglaze across and print it onto the tissue paper. Uh, this, one thing about this is this doesn't obviously fill the whole screen, and so I have to do two swipes. Sometimes there will be a little bit of overlap in the middle, but again, that doesn't necessarily bother me. So I'm just gonna swipe it across. And if you're familiar with screen printing, I don't necessarily flood my screens, which is holding it up off of the paper first and, and pulling the ink across it. Um, I just don't find it necessary with what I'm doing. And then I'm gonna peel this back. And so the image has been printed onto the tissue paper. And so you can see, especially like up here, it did bleed out through the screen a little bit when I printed it. Um, you can see some of the wrinkles through here. Uh, but again, I'm not personally too worried about that. Um, I am gonna let this sit to the side and dry for a few minutes uh, while we look at something else for the moment. Um, normally with this work, uh, I actually transfer onto Bisquare. Um, and so we'll, we'll do that here in a minute um, once this has dried up a little bit. Um, but the Bisquare basically acts as like a, a sponge because it's so porous when I go to transfer this. And we'll see that in just a minute. Okay, but I do let it dry first. And you can kind of see it bled through the paper a little bit since the paper is so thin. I'm not too worried about that. Um, and this surface just cleans up anyway. Um, if I'm printing a lot, like I'll, I'll, I can maybe print that screen, I don't know, a handful, maybe six or seven times um, before uh, it just becomes too flooded and it gets too messy. Um, but yeah, a lot of times I'll clean up the surface if it, if it gets really thick and isn't dry. But with just one print, this is fine. Okay, so what I have kind of switched to now, or am working on now, experimenting with, is still a form of underglaze transfer, um, but it's using newsprint and it is on greenware. So um, I've been messing around with layering underglazes. So, um, because I'm layering them, it's a little bit different than working with just a print in one color. Um, you have to think backwards a little bit when you're printing. Um, let me find an example. So this is some of the stuff I'm working on now. I don't know how close I can get this to see. You can see there's, there's some, a few different colors in this. Um, and it's a little washy. How I achieved that is layering the underglazes on this. Um, and so, and I think these are even maybe the same colors. So you have to think backwards in the fact that like the, the um, last color you put on top here is gonna be the bottom color and vice versa. So the first color I'm putting on here, even though I'm gonna cover it up with other colors, it's going to be the one that shows on the surface. So I'm gonna start with the, I've got a mint green, coral, and then I'm gonna use the jet black again. Um, and so I'm gonna start with the lightest one because I wanna be able to see that. Um, and all I've been doing is kind of just really abstract brush strokes. So I'll maybe do that with that color. I'm leaving some areas where the other colors might show through it later. 
And normally I would let this dry a little bit so the colors don't necessarily mix together. I have a hair dryer on hand a lot of times that I, I dry stuff off with, or not dry it off, but help the, the, the underglaze dry before I move on to the next uh, layer, but I'm just gonna go ahead and do it. So then I've got the coral, I'm just gonna go right over the top. And you can see some of the green through it. I'm covering some of the areas that I didn't hit with the green. And the paper's gonna warp a little bit and wiggle as you add moisture to it, obviously. But. And then I'm gonna take the black. And actually with this black, I'm gonna almost completely cover this. It's gonna mix a little bit since that, that coral is so wet. Like I said, I would normally dry these in between colors, but I also don't want to make you guys listen to a hair dryer. All right, so that is essentially that. And through the magic of video, I have a dry one here. I'm just gonna move this out of the way. All right, so I have just some tiles uh, that I have cut that we're gonna try this out on. So these are, I rolled these out last night. They're stiff, but I can still feel that they're, they're pretty wet. Um, but it, it's, it's not going to bend. If I were to start to bend it, it would just break. Um, so what I am going to do, um, I'm going to take this, this paper, I'm going to sketch out some shapes that I'm going to cut and we'll stick with kind of what I was showing you guys on that plate, just for consistency's sake. So you probably, it's a little difficult to see, but I just drew out some shapes. I'm gonna cut them out. Because this underglaze is dry, it may flake a little bit as I apply pressure and cut. So I just try to do it fairly delicately. Okay. All right. So, like I mentioned, when Katie said she really likes the red ribs, I like these, yes, for throwing, for the altering I do afterwards, and for doing this printing with these. Um, so I'm going to transfer this underglaze onto um, the raw clay. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to turn it over. So you can see the black there kind of is on top that will ultimately be on the bottom. I'm gonna put it where I need it. And then I've got a, just a wet sponge. I'm just gonna kind of get it wet. And then I'm gonna take my rib and really put some pressure on it to help transfer that underglaze. And by doing this, it also gives a little bit of relief to the print because the clay is moving around that that uh, newsprint. And then I can go ahead and keep adding some more. And I'm going to add, nope, that's not going to work. There we go. I have one device muted and one going. Yep, <laughs> you were right. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to put this last one on here. 
and wet it down. All right. So I'm just kind of making sure I've really put some pressure on there. And there's some, some slurry coming off on the rib as I do that. It's just surface for the most part since this uh, clay is pretty stiff. All right. And then how I did this and, and the, um, the background color is black. Now what I can do is I can leave that newsprint on there and before I peel it off, I can put a, uh, just a solid surface color on the piece as well. I'm just going to throw some color on here. And you could really build this up in some layers. I kind of like the clay showing back through the underglaze. So I'm going to now let that dry for a few minutes while we go back to the screen printed one. Um, so I realized this morning that I have no bisqueware in my studio since I just moved it out here and I trashed a bunch of stuff that was spare bisqueware that I wasn't going to finish. So this is not my piece and it's not super ideal, but um, you can bring this back up here. Water off. So this is, I would let this maybe actually dry just a little bit more, but we'll go ahead and, and do it. From here, I can cut out pieces, and you can kind of see with this, I have cut some, um, some of these individual sections so that I can lay them and arrange the pattern how I want. Um, but I just want to show you, let me just cut some pieces out here. You may have seen people printing screen printing directly onto clay a lot um, and that totally works but part of the reason I like doing this transfer is because I can then wrap it around a piece. So it's going to be the same kind of thing and um, I am I usually tell people I compare this to doing a clay um, temporary tattoo. So I've got my printed piece here. I'm going to turn it over onto the surface and then I'm just going to take a spray bottle and spray it on there. You kind of see because that clay is so, or the bisqueware is so porous, it just sucked it right onto the piece. Uh, but I can see all kinds of wrinkles right now, um, areas that it's not quite fitting into. So I'm going to go ahead and take a wet sponge I'm just gonna compress that image onto the bisqueware. And you can kind of see, I don't know if it's, it might not go well enough, uh, like especially around this foot where there's a, a ridge there, I'm really kind of going in there and trying to push it into that area. Um, and like I said, it's nice that the um, tissue paper is so thin because it will kind of just form to this piece. Um, versus the newsprint is a little thicker and doesn't do that as well. Okay. So after you have done that, you can kind of see too if the, the, the paper is still white in some areas rather than more translucent. Uh, it maybe isn't gonna sh hasn't transferred there as well. Or sometimes, um, I don't know if you can see that, there's like a little darker spot on that little area that maybe hasn't transferred as well. We'll find out here in a second. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and just peel it off. All right, so 
there it has transferred onto the piece. Um, and I can even go back and if it got into areas I don't necessarily want it, I can kind of clean it off. All right. And then I can glaze just directly over it. Um, sometimes if the underglaze is a little too thick, uh, it won't uh, absorb the glaze quite as well. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Most of my glazes don't have issues with that. And because I've done such a thin screen print on this, that's not an issue either. Um, but if, that, if you did run into issues with that, you could always run this through the bisque again, and then it would permanently fire that uh, underglaze on there and it would be uh, more porous and absorb the glaze better. So put that to the side. So we'll see how well this peels off. It might be too wet still. So here's my other tile. I'm trying to see if you can, you can kind of see the sheen there where the, the three pieces of newsprint are. And so I'm just gonna take an X-Acto and kind of find the edge of one of them and start to pull up. And so even though, remember when I put this on, it was really black in the background, it now of course has the green, which was the first color that we put on uh, showing up on top. So that's what I was getting at with the, um, being careful to remember to do it backwards. Your, your top color is what you wanna put down first on the newsprint. So there are my three little shapes. Um, I don't know if you can see that, but you can kind of see where I had pushed these first two down in. There is like a little bit of a ridge, so you can see those. Um, and you can certainly, certainly see it on like these here. So, all right. I think those are the two main things I was going to show you all, but there's other there's other things you can do now on this as well. Like on the plate there, I've taken I've got I got these tools at Armadillo in a package. I don't even know if they have a brand, uh, but one end is a nice um, rubber tip, and there's different shapes in that came in the pack, and then this end are these little focus there maybe these little drawing nibs and so there's a range of sizes in those too um, but I can scraffito now into this clay as well it's honestly probably a little wet but and so then I can I can bring that clay body back out through that solid color as well so and then these will ultimately get a clear glaze on them um, after they've been bisque fired. I might do some more things too, like once it's been bisque, I may inlay some color, either under glaze or glaze into those scraffito lines. Um, those, that's something you can do as well. Okay. All right, well. That brings us right to four o'clock and kind of the end of our day. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming and, and watching all the demos. Um, I know some people came in late. I'm going to finish up talking here and then I'll replay Ryan's um, studio tour as well for any that missed it. Um, as Jennifer mentioned, there are some virtual classes coming up at the DAC. Um, you can see those. Um, on our rec track system. Um, they'll also go out in a newsletter um, later this week. Um, but yes, we're going to attempt some virtual classes. So um, let's see here. Thank you guys again for coming. Um, I appreciate everybody and everybody being so patient with us at the DAC as we've tried to figure things out and open back up and then close back down and then try to open and close. So. 
Um, we appreciate everybody's patience. We've missed all of you as well. Um, we hope to be back in in-person classes sometime soon, but we'll do our best. So uh, thank you guys again, and I'm gonna go ahead and pull Ryan's video back up one last time. So everybody enjoy the rest of your week, and thanks for coming. All right, everybody, how's it going? This is Ryan McCurley for the Doherty Art Center, and this is my studio tour for Clay Week. This is my wall of coffee mugs in my kitchen dining room, and we're gonna walk into my cozy in-house studio. Gonna have to zoom out a little, there we go, that's perfect. Um, this is a one car garage. I really like all the natural light that I've got in here. Got all my glaze buckets down there. Got my wheel on a stand so I can stand up when I'm making pots on the wheel. Here's my bamboo plant. Some of my clipboards and tools. This is definitely the smallest studio I've ever had, but it worked and I've, I've enjoyed working in here. Here's some of my finished work. Let's take a look at some of these jars and vases. Here's some of my cups. Here's some things that are in process. Some of my carved cups that I've been working on. It's my new favorite thing to do. This is the newest item. Carved jars for sugar. All right, got another table over there. There's my clay supply. Here are my clipboards with all of my orders and special notes. I've been working on building a studio in my backyard the last couple of years while I've been working in this studio. So let's go check that out right now. There's my kitchen. Here's my backyard and there's my new studio. Put my shoes on. First, let's take a look at my kiln shed. My electric kilns are in here. I've got two of them. <clears throat> I've also got all my glazed chemicals over there. All those pots that pile up in pottery studios and some tools. There's my kiln shelves and my kiln posts. I love working in this kiln shed. I've got this beautiful view of the sky right there. It's like being outside and inside at the same time. All right, I'm gonna zoom out. We'll walk over here. We're going to take a look at my <clears throat> my brand new studio. The outside's almost done. I just have to work on <clears throat> some of the metal siding. Look at that big porch. That's where I'll be hanging out. I'll be hanging out probably right there where all that stuff is. That's where I'll be sitting all the time thinking about what I'm gonna make. There we go. And I'll be coming in and out of this other door. There's the covered porch extends around to the backside. And this is where my electric kilns will be. They're gonna get moved from that other shed into this area right here. It's gonna be pretty exciting. So I could walk out that door right there, walk over to the electric kiln. I won't have to go outside. I can load my electric kilns when it's raining. Won't be a problem. All right, let's 
zoom back out there we go let's take a look inside <clears throat> So the footprint of this studio is 20 by 18 feet. And that, that wall right there is about 15 feet tall. The back wall behind me is about nine feet. I'm really proud of this wall of windows and doors. We got the spacing just right on those windows up there. I love looking at the clouds through those windows. My wheel is gonna be up against that wall, right next to where the bicycle is. And kind of look up this, look out this window while I'm working. This back wall is gonna be covered with shelving units on wheels so I can move them around for when I have workshops in here. There's gonna be some tables over on this wall. I'm gonna try and keep it really open and not cram it full of stuff like my other studio, but we'll see. I made a hole in the wall and there's gonna be a hose attached to this hole and there's gonna be a powerful vent fan outside so I'll be able to um, do dusty work inside in comfort and have it all sucked out of this tube. It'll be ultra safe, I'm really excited about that. Um, yeah, I think that's about it inside. Let's go outside and take a look at my gas kiln. This is where I fire all my pots. Right there. It's got four burners that shoot through the floor of the kiln. Let's take a look inside the kiln. I spray a glaze into the kiln during the firing, so <laughs> the kiln is slowly melting on the inside. Check out those beautiful colors right there. So all these bricks get glazed during each firing. This is called a soda kiln. Doors got a lot of, a lot of color happening as well. It takes about 10 hours to fire this kiln to 2,400 degrees Fahrenheit, and it takes about 24 hours to cool down. And I think that is the end of my studio tour. Let's take one more look at my new studio space. I'll be working in here soon. The next time you come to visit, we'll be hanging out in here. This is Ryan McCurley for the Doherty Arts Center. Thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.